Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valeria Lewov and uh, welcome to today's lecture uh, on YouTube. So today we're going to be talking about one of the most brilliant openings and this is the King's Indian. I can tell you about an opening I'm more excited about uh, to talk about and you know it's just it's been a while since I played King's Indian. In fact I don't even remember when I did that but it wasn't because I don't like it. I mean, some of you have probably seen some of my games and say, Valerie, you're talking about King Sindian, but you haven't played it. I love the opening, but there's one thing about it. It's a little bit complex. So the purpose of today's lecture is instead of being like me and trying to avoid it because it's not as easy as the other lines, learn all the complex subtleties, get good at it, and oh, you know this opening can bring you so much as black versus d4. I've never had the guts to play it, but I can tell you, you can be better than me. You can learn it, you can embrace it, and you can destroy the white d4 as long as you know how to. So today we're going to talk about some of the key things, the key patterns that you need to know about King Sindhian. And keep in mind, it's a, wide, it's a wide opening. There's a lot for you to know. So I will try to be as precise as possible. And of course, if you have any questions, just to let you know, you're more than welcome to uh, write me on the chat. So there is this chat window, which I would love you to write. Ask me any questions that you may have, anything like that. I'll be more than happy to bring you my feedback and suggestions uh, as always. So thank you, for, thank you for that. And just to let you know all, guys, like below this video, there is a fantastic offer. I mean, you've probably seen that one. It's it's there's a bundle on how to dis don't dominate with the Kings Indian defense, and it's fifty percent off. It's like uh, like a number of DVDs by by top players who explain absolutely every little detail. So I hope as long as you get excited about the opening, this could be a great addition to the to today's training. So what are we going to start with today? I'd like to start with an example. A lot of time as, uh, people ask me what's King's Indian all about. So let's go over the goal. King's Indian is all about black being able to develop quickly without really caring so much of the center control but more relying on a nice and flexible pawns formation that sort of shields black from any early attempts for white to attack like e5 and at the same time gives him a faster development because keep in mind white starts first but not only that he's lost his extra tempo by having uh, uh, like black equalize the development but black has developed one extra piece than, than white so white is too tempy down the tempy the extra moves that he needed for those two pawns yes surely white controls a lot of the center but that doesn't mean that this is decisive. In fact, if black gets to counter white center, then the middle, the middle of the board of white will not matter. It's just it wouldn't be anything significant while black's counterplay will matter. So let's talk about the classical one. Most chess players do knight f3 here. I will cover the theoretical part first, and then we'll go from the theoretical part to the, pra to the practical part. Now, just to let you know a little bit about the theory, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open here the live book. Now, this is a very cool tool with a bunch of interesting games and evaluations and all by grandmasters and, com and, and some of the strongest engines. So this will give you a little bit of an idea how many games of certain moves are being played with and which one could be the better. So you can easily pause and compare the different possibilities if you ever wonder, okay, like, what if that or that? I mean, who played this? Why, why didn't people do that? So I'm just going to open that up, and then you can make a reference uh, you know, as I speak. So what should black do now? The most common move, naturally, is a castling. And the reason why black does it is because he hides the king. And now he's preparing himself for a challenge. There are two main ways how he can play. There is e5 to try and challenge the white center like this, or maybe c5 to go in the opposite way. I think both of them are fine, as long as black could be consistent. So, for example, uh, what we could say is let's begin with c5. c5 is the more straightforward, although it's probably not as popular as the, uh, as the other ones. So, essentially, if white play, black plays c5, white can choose to move with d5 or castle. 
Now, what is C5 all about? Now, keep in mind something. When you're studying opening theory, never focus on the moves alone. Focus on the moves as part of the plan, as a part of the actual goal. Like, what is one going for? Black's main goal here is to exchange or take away this pawn so he can open the bishop. And further on, the c5 pawn is genuinely going to help black advance on the queen side. So, for instance, if white plays in this position a move like, say, d dx to the c, which some people do, it's not that good though, black can do queen a5 castles and I think even queen dicks to the c5 works. It seems like a very good and enhanced Sicilian as the black dark square bishop is pretty awesome. The knight can come out too. Sure, d dicks to the c also works out. I think black is able to do that and get a fine game. But yes, Jinji is the uh, c5 is the Jinji Indian. No, Jinji Indian is a lot earlier on, just so that you know. The, uh, does it transpose to the Benoni? Yes, it could. D5 transposes into another opening, which is basically black and transpose into the Benoni systems with E6, the modern Benoni, which is very different to what we're going to talk about today. If I if I go into that, it's going to be really at least a topic for a different lecture, which we'll probably have. It's just a different opening. Uh, another plan that I've personally loved is black playing a move of knight A6. And if somebody's ever like looking for an easy line to play this, you can consider playing knight e6 to c7. And then the point behind it is that we can advance with a6 and go with knight d7 and open the bishop. Now, is that anything special? Yes, it is. Keep in mind that black's major goal to follow will be to prepare with b5 and either do it or make white to kind of defend down there. There is another idea too. Like, for example, if white plays with a4, there is a smart possibility for black to lock the middle with e5, which gives him another brilliant opportunity. The idea being will be that this knight will move, and eventually as black gets to move it, he'd love to challenge white's position with f5. How is that helpful? Well, take a look. The white possibilities on the queen side are closed as he's got a very weak square and, I mean, the pawns don't look particularly great together. And, for example, if white plays something like, say, bishop e3, the knight jumps, and black has one goal. In the King's Indian, the general idea for black is to play f5 plus f4, h6 and g5. To some, this type of pawn, king's pawn storm, may seem a little dangerous. The good news is that there is really nothing to fear as the bishop on g7 always protects the king, and there is more. Knight f4 is also a perfect idea, as if white exchanges it, even if that is a sacrifice, you could still get a lot of opportunities with the, with the bishop, and then f5, as you mentioned. Yes, definitely. So this is something very easy. If you want an easy opening, you can just remember that sequence. c5, if white closes the center, Okay, if he opens it up, then just, I mean, it's, he gets nothing. This is, this basically, we're going to talk a little bit more about the exchange of queens if he does later on in today's lecture, but it just means nothing. He gets no advantage out of it. If he closes, the point behind is you can go, either go with the Benoni, which is cool, but it's different, or maybe do it simpler. Knight comes around here. It supports the B5 pre preparation. We can prepare for that. And when white locks it, we play e5. And we're so flexible in this position, so we can actually look for any area of the board. Uh, you know, king side, center, and everywhere else. You know, when I was younger, sometimes when I looked at that position, I was like, ah, I don't know. I mean, this pawn is so horrible right now, right? I mean, white can do bishop e3, and he can start challenging. And then I realized that, yes, the pawn isn't that great. But black is getting so much for it, and he's not going to lose it. He can place the bishop on b7, he can challenge the e4, he can move that knight onto h5 and f4, and then he can get this really good development, like the bishop coming forward, queen going out, and so on, which I think will be uh, effective. In some other occasions, you could very easily see that there is an f takes to you with a plan of e5 to triple those pawns around here and then move the knight. But those are just ideas, of course, something that you can keep in mind at when you're playing. Now, there is a lot more theory to that, so I'm just trying to sort of summarize so you can keep those in mind. Now, let's go with the real, uh, like, question. 
Okay, just in case you're wondering, if in case you're wondering, sometimes, on occasion, white can play a short castle. Now, this happens with the line of e5, and it can happen with the lines of c5 too. There's nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, it's okay. But now, Black's major goal is to look down this diagonal and focus on challenging White's center. A trade here may lead into the Marozzi buying of the kings of the Sicilian. Not one of my favorites, but still pretty decent for Black to play. I personally love the idea of playing, you know, a little bit differently. Maybe a move of knight c6 can also help out. So should white play with d5, then we get knight a5. Now, uh, the whole idea is that black could still go with e6 or maybe a6 and bishop, you know, or rook to b8. So, uh, you know, there are different ways on how we can try to challenge against the white pawns in the middle. The good news is that black has a play and this could really turn into something pretty good. The, the possibility for weakness is always there. It's interesting. So to sum it up, c5 often leads to Benoni structures, which are not very typical for King Cindy. And, and yet, if you like the idea of how of staying with the pawn down there and playing mainly on the queen, mainly on the queen side, it's more positional. You can do it. Now, e5, however, is the primary line or variation. Now, what is this all about? Let's talk about it. E5 provides rather than an opportunity to take it. So a lot of people will be like, ah, this is a pawn. Why would anybody like to give away a pawn? It makes no sense, and it looks very sweet. Takes, takes, not x to the. Some of you might already know, others may not, that this pawn is not available. It looks available for one move. But then the sooner black makes the combination of knight x d4, he practically destroys white's position in the in the center, and thereby uh, like the winning move, so to speak, really doesn't turn out to be so winning as it seems. So you don't have to worry. The the fact is after knight x d bishop takes c5, there is a complete exchange equalizing, and uh, yes, it uh, it's just a really easy to play for. So that's how the plan is, is supposed to go. Less problems, easy way of development, and uh, a nice nice way to come forward. Uh, like moving down to the earlier position, I mean seeing the the DDX to the E uh, available, I mean of course uh, like exchanging mostly doesn't help because that leaves black very solid in the center. And if you're playing this with black, remember that uh, in many occasions, the idea for black is to play c6, cover the squares of d5 and b5. Then he can move the queen, possibly to c7, or sometimes even to e7. And then plan along with a5 to cover that square. The knight can move, and so on. Black is quite capable of reaching equality or even more. In fact, d d isn't supposed to give white anything. So, uh, in that specific position, if white plays, what if white goes for short castles? Now, almost anyone would like to think about this. Drawish? No. Equal? Yes. Remember the difference between those two. Drawish is when a position is actually draw. However, equal is what black is looking for in most of the times. He wants to equalize the game as he's a tempo down and then fight for advantage. The energy that black is able to get or acquire in most of these uh, positions is brilliant. Imagine knight c6, d5, knight e7 turning out, and then the opportunity for, uh, for advance. Now, I want you to understand this type of position. What is this position all about here? The, this position is all about uh, like black setting up and really moving across the king side. There will be different ways to achieve it, but let's take a look at one of the main lines now. I want you to, understand, to remember the center. These pawns versus those pawns require different plans. While white is going to be going for c5 and queen side attack for the most part, Black's plan will be mainly, mainly to advance, similar to what I showed you earlier, to uh, go ahead with knight h5 to f4, and then maybe f5. 
this will be beautiful to advance. The sequence looks great. The resources also feel uh, terrific. And uh, in fact, actually, if we play with f5, h6, g5, uh, you know, knight to the g6, and more forces on that side will be good. Beautiful sequence, a relevant, a relevant variation to advance. Now, how do we know who is going to be more successful? Now, that's a good question. There is no way to say it because there is no way to expect is white or black going to be good. I would say that it all depends on the the possibilities, like whites and blacks, different possibilities uh, in terms of speed, threats, and so on. However, one thing that you need to know is that I always favor a little more black, not because I'm a fan of the King's Indian, well, maybe a little bit of that, but mainly because black's major goal is to reach white's king, and white's major goal is to reach black's pawns, I guess, win some of them, really? No, I mean, like, obviously there is more than that, but yeah, let's take a look and see a sample way on how this whole thing goes. Black moves the knight up. He's preparing to advance the pawn and get this knight here. White will play his rook around. Of course, he doesn't want to lose the bishop. He prepares himself. Now, f4 or knight f4 can happen as moves. Like, in case of f5, uh, White wouldn't like that. So, he might actually jump with his knight and try to advance. So, that's why you know, taking a moment to play with knight f4 is a very good idea. Surely exchanging the, the knight will let black to open. So this is not something white would like to do here. And of course, there is an opportunity for black to play f5 now. So this looks good. It's a very double-edged position. Very double-edged. I don't believe that anyone is better. It's a complex position that can lead to anything. Specifically, if you are wondering why g3 doesn't work, it will leave some weaknesses and all for white. Uh, the light squares may be covered by the bishop, but you know, in the end of the day, especially if white plays bishop g2, black can do f4, and you realize this whole area of the board just doesn't quite look good with the white pawns having moved. So that's a very interesting position. Black's planning up, and then okay, what are white's options? Somebody can try rig b1. Then we can have h6 avail available, or even f takes d, knight takes d, then h6, or maybe even bishop to the g4. I'm a great fan of the position for black, although there's a lot of theory that we just don't have the time to cover today in this in this lesson. Now, I know what you're going to be wondering. Why would white need to push the pawn? Come on, Valerie. We just did castling. We didn't want to push it. Why would you push it? If you're wondering about that, here is why. If white doesn't push the pawn, black is the one to take. And then there is a very important thing. Where black could even consider starting making this combination of knight x to the e4, which doubles the attack on d4 two times. And then we can capture c3. And this is a very, very sweet tactic that really keeps uh, like white destroyed. It's a very powerful sequence. So you see, you realize that uh, white's put under pressure there. Even if he tries to protect that, then black can still do knight g4. So we realize that if, white's tries to, if white tries to keep everything in the center rather flexible, he cannot succeed with it. He will be challenged. Of course, in case white attempts to do a move like d5, black could do a move of pawn to the a5, castling short, and then black can do knight a6. Bishop to the g5 is going to happen. Black can move h6, bishop h4, queen e8, and uh, you know things are going pretty strongly on that area of the board. So, like in fact, after that move, in case of knight to the d2, we can see black is still going to prepare his general plan. You know what's good about this opening? You don't need to know the theory all that much. All you need to know is what this is all about, and it's about king side attack. So let's get this going. A little bit after, we can do f5, f3, bishop d7, perhaps if you want to cover that square. It's not necessary. A lot of times you don't need to develop that bishop. But this move also makes a very smart tactic. If white is just playing rig b1, he wants to advance, our bishop and the queen will help, help, help us to kind of hold him back. 
and this exchange will make a lot of terrible problems with White's plan and his advances. So that's, I guess, a smart idea to do it like that. It costs him a more time. And then Black is able to advance F4 here, and then there is G5. As I said, this is the ultimate goal. Black advances on the king side, and the plan is really the same. Queen g6, followed by h5, followed by g4, followed by knight g5. With the queen, the pawns, the knight, and everything else coming together on king side, I really don't feel like white's going to have a, a very lovely position. And sure, I mean, you can try rig b1 to prepare h5 and b4, but then in case of the exchange and queen to g6, uh, it's, it's a very, very interesting game that is turning out. In one way or another, uh, you know, like maybe, maybe of course, Black can take a little bit of time to secure himself from this move. Oh, White could still try it, and I mean, like there's, there is just a, a whole bunch of theory out there. For example, exchange takes White can sacrifice the pawn, but the idea being is that maybe he could try to open up the position. That's something he would do. Black is a little bit backward, so in this case, it could even turn out a little bit better. But of course, Black doesn't have to play like that. If you think of the of the best way to advance, uh, I think one of the smart ideas could be to play Rook F6, and should White play C5, Rook G6. The plan then is that White doesn't get any of these breaks, and then when he captures the pawn, we get G4, and that's really smart. We can even sacrifice a pawn because the way our own pawns and the way uh, Black's attack is going to go against White's king is looking real smart. Like imagine g3, then the take, and then the queen coming down. You know, it's really not a very easy position for White, and it's very double-edged. There are possibilities and resources for both sides. But I'm not trying to explain your theory. So if you're looking at this and you're saying, Valerie, come on, man, how am I supposed to remember all that? Don't. Don't try to remember it. Try to just understand what it's about. Because when you understand the idea, the moves you easily know, you easily recognize in the game. So that's basically what this plan is about. Now, of course, this is not everything. I want to show you two more lines before we go to the practical side and I show you some brilliant ideas of the opening. First off, what if White plays F3? I bet some of you have actually thought of this move like so what if white goes with the move of f3 zemish yes you know the zemish is a challenging system the real reason for white to play f3 is to use a center so instead of actually going for a simple short castles and trying to positionally advance on the queen side to keep that support around the middle and the pawn on f3 to help him out with some king side activity. Now, see, this is a complex. Now, one one thing I'd like to mention, uh, just for a second, to interrupt and then mention to you this: keep in mind that this whole opening is not very easy. So, it has a lot of subtleties that I can explain so much about in today's lesson because I'm going to divide it in two parts. We have the theoretical part, and then we have the practical part. On another hand, you can check the link below this video, which includes some really cool courses. Let me give you a short brief on that. There is e Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein's brilliant ideas on how to use the Knight A6 idea, which I showed earlier, Knight C5. It's like a DVD, which is amazing. So uh, then there is Grandmaster Leonid Kretz's uh, repertoire for black against pretty much anything that you could expect. Then there is uh, um, Fide Master's Melechina suggestions on some pretty cool systems that you could uh, that, that is that are brilliant that are perfect for club to master level players. And then uh, like uh, there are two international masters with like uh, I would say uh, more than more than 11 hours of instruction on the King's Indian that they provide, uh, International Master Ferreira and Richard. And so, I mean, this is brilliant because you're getting a lot of, uh, like, of training material for an incredible price of, like, 29.99. I mean, this is with a 50% discount, you're going to get, uh, you know, more than, I think, more than 15 to 20 hours of training on 
the King Cynthia. I mean, check that out. You're talking. You're, we're talking about top grandmasters and international masters explaining you even the little, the small, delicate details of this opening. Much more than I can do within just this one hour. The, you know, you so you get around 20 hours. You can actually divide that and you know, to study it every day. And in the end, you can play this extremely successfully because that's probably the most aggressive opening you can choose as black uh, versus per, first pawn to d4. So check it out. It's a great deal. 50% off. Brilliant brilliant uh, uh, like opening course. I'm just going to post a link on the chat, but you can also check it out on the link below, so below the video. So let's get back to the, to the damage variation. What is white supposed to do? I'm guessing one of the plans that he could do is to play with d5. Okay, so closing down the set, we already saw what happens if he doesn't. So what does black do now? Like c6 is one of the options, a typical idea to eventually exchange and prepare uh, in case white castles long. I think it's a good one. In case white plays bishop d3, then there is exchange and knight h5. Or you can choose to play the knight h5 directly. Let's go with that first. White can do queen d2. Black can play pawn f5. And in the moment white castles long, we can do knight d7. The problem here is that we're only playing on one side, and there is certainly a little bit of a problem with the opening of files on queen side. So that's why playing c6 is smart, because imagine that we can have the c file open against the white king now, something that we quite, we're quite absent in this position. So c6 gives us a chance to open up that c line in case white castles, and so when we play f5, we realize that it's not that easy for white to just bring out the queen and castle on the open line. For this reason, like white can play e to f, but then actually black could do g to f, and then in case white castles short, there is knight d7. Now this is again a very double-edged variation. A lot of grandmasters have played this line, and it's it leads to unique positions that are just impossible to, to learn, calculate, or even understand fully. There's so much energy and potential, and you know what? You do want to, you need to know just one thing. It's all going on the uh, a king side. The whole play that black has in this position is supposed to, to, to stand within the idea of stabilizing on the other area and focusing his, intention, his attention on king side. The great thing is that you keep the integrity of your position, so there is no real weakness, and that's something smart you can try. Of course, there is more. I mean, in case white attempts to use the pawn, I mean, we already talked about that, didn't we? <laughs> Castling, yeah. And you know, there is a6, a6, and then b5. That leads me to one of my best and really cool ideas. I love the c6, a6, and b5 idea in King Sindian. If you're ever thinking or trying to pick up on a line or a variation that help, get, helps you to, to build on, on a good structure, this is perfect. Because the a6, c6, and b5 idea really creates what we call as a brilliant challenge. So let's talk about it again. Knight e2, c6, we develop the knight, of course. We play a6, and we do b5. Now, if white opens, then this is going to be horrible, because this will come directly against this king. More importantly, if he moves right back, we've got the change, takes, and likely a move of rook e8. That will be great. You see, there is the tension to exchange an open-up line at any second. So you can understand why that idea is so strong and why white can't do anything about it. So consider the a6, c6, and b5 as best as you can. So that's basically the main summary on the Zemish. And now let me talk about one last one. What do you do when your opponent tries to be super aggressive, moving those pawns and coming like that? There are different ways now you can go about this. I personally like the, the, the c5, although that often transfers into the Benoni. If you want to stick within the king's Indian, you can play knight a6, bishop d3, and then look at the e5. Yeah! e5 move is super good because with that move in line, you destroy white center. In fact, some of you may wonder, Valerie, this is crazy. What would I do? do if he just takes the pawn. Taking the pawn shouldn't bother you because in reality white is very much behind in development. Usually that pawn cannot be kept, even if he can take it for a move or two or tries to preserve it. An exchange, take, 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 and a rookie eight shows you that in reality this pawn is going to be taken. 
like really just taken. Bishop f5 and f6 next move really leaves no doubt that white will lose material and he's in trouble. So this is a really smart way of breaking white in the middle. Just don't forget it. If you ever see this line of f4 somebody playing, develop your knight on a6 and then break. Surely that does not losing for him, but you see he can't take that pawn. Not like now, if he takes with the knight, the pawn falls. And if he takes with the pawn, it's just going to be taken. So uh, essentially white has to lock it, but then black has plenty of good ways to fight. C6 is a great idea, often used by masters to uh, like simplify the position. And then there is a very brilliant uh, or like maneuver of the knight, so it can come down to d6, and then we can open the opportunity of f5. That way we'll block the uh, pass pawn, and we'll challenge white in the, in the center. It's brilliant. Is there more to it? Sure, but I think that most of the black problems are resolved, and uh, that's what I can show you in terms of theory, okay? Now, again, I know it's not much. I do realize that, but remember one thing. I, the, my goal here was not to show you all of this. Keep in mind, to play this opening successfully, you definitely want to back it up with not just knowing like the simple ideas, but knowing exactly the lines, the goals, the different sequences. And that's why you've got this more than 15 to, I don't know how much it is. Like I know that it's more than 15 hours of video, like course and training for like $20. You can actually get it uh, on the link below just, just during this webinar, so like check this out. It's a brilliant, brilliant course. So you're gonna see lectures by top GMs and and uh, like leading leading chess teachers on everything you need to know about King Indian so that you can be as successful as possible. So I really recommend you check it out, see what it's about. It's beautiful. So now let's talk a bit about some good examples of this opening. Because I really want to show you. Now we're going to go with a very nice example that uh, like uh, shows a very uh, so it shows an interesting game, interesting way on well, how to deal with the annoying queen exchange. You know, I've seen by many chess players they ask Valerie, I don't know what to do when people exchange the queens. They just kill off my whole attack. So I want to show you this pretty good game. It was played by a grandmaster. And uh, he showed brilliantly how to handle that that opening, really. So let's talk a bit about that. This is a good opening. Brunner versus Kajgaliev. That was the game played in the 2005 France Chess Top 16, uh, whatever. <laughs> so it was a good game to see what to do if you, uh, your opponent is annoying. D4. Knight of six, c4, g6. Now white played this, bishop g7, e4, d6. And then after knight f3, black castled, and then he played e5. So now white said, you know what? I don't want to let this knight c6 or f5 set type of stuff to happen. So I'm going to exchange here, and I'm going to take the queens. And I want you to prove me that you can play this position and you can be successful. So you see, if you don't know it, it's going to be challenging. Yet Black was a strong grandmaster. So you know that the first thing that he needs to do is to complete his development and stabilize e5. Even though earlier, before the white bishop comes out, this pawn wasn't that, uh, an object to attack, it can be, become challenged if the pawn knight is pinned. So stabilizing makes sense. White figured out that this will be a good way to play this. I'd say that long side castling was perhaps the better move, but he just challenged, went on to play knight e7, and he said, okay, you know what? I'm going to take away your bishop pair, so you got another problem. You can never open the position because of my bis bishops. So he does knight d2. Now here comes my first question to you guys, and yes, the theoretical part is kind of over, so we go with the practical part. What would you do if you have this as black? Think about this position. Check it out, look around, and think. Remember that it's all about maneuvering. An end game is about making your pieces better. So I think black has the perfect opportunity to prove it. Take a look and let me know. So, what do we do now? Okay, now... <clears throat> 
97 blocks to work. Yeah, I think kind of. It certainly does. But I need you to think. Like, think very carefully here. We can move the king. Sure, we could. But I don't know. I don't think this is a really great idea. There is another possibility to follow. Yes, knight c5. Fantastic. This is beautiful. You see? It's like... That's one of the reasons why I love studying openings from videos. Because... They just show these small little ideas that I would never be able to read from a book. I mean, the books show a lot of games and examples and whatever, but it's hard to absorb all that information. The master videos show you the essence. Like, the, for example, when you see a move like knight c5 with the maneuver of knight e6, it's just so enlightening. You can challenge the bishop, you can grade the knight, oh, you, can, you can get the knight on the d4, and you can create a lot of extra pressure versus white. f3, knight e6 to threaten. Then, of course, white plays bishop e3, and then black did knight d7. It's a lovely sequence. And so all in all, black is starting to maneuver and really get his pieces together, gathering them around the right position. King e8, g3, bishop f8. That dark square bishop may sound like it is probably the best piece, and while I certainly like it, it's it's a very good thinking. And then ultimately what you find out is that uh, there is a great option to follow. Uh, in fact, uh, like what we see is that there is a chance to step up. In fact, uh, after continuing with the move of bishop c5 in case of the exchange, there is the retake. And so things are quite clear. After that move of bishop to f8, <clears throat> uh, of course... It's just uh, excellent. In case of the exchange, there will be the retake. Uh, so, uh, great. So, let's see what happens after that. Well, white plays knight b3, hoping to stop it. So, would anybody have a suggestion or a thought what to do now? Okay. What do we do next? <clears throat> Keep in mind, the, the knights are good. And the bishop is almost ready to improve, but why is kind of taking this, this square? B5, smart. But keep in mind, that move isn't going to lead to anything. White wouldn't just have to worry. He'll go back to B1. Can we do A5? Yes, we could. Absolutely. And I, I want to take the moment to remind you all, if you want me to send you a PGN file with all the graphic commentary and the, the you know like the annotations from this lecture, you can just send me an email. I'm gonna I'm gonna type in my email right now in the chat. So you can send an email to valeri.lilov at gmail.com. So that's uh, you can check you can send me on that. Just ask me for the PGN of the of today's webinar with all the graphic annotations for further studying. I know it's some information, but that's what I can sum up in just one hour. 30 minutes of practical stuff and then 30 minutes of theoretical ideas to get an idea of what this is about. So send me an email about that. I'll be more than happy to bring you with to to, the, to, to give you the, the PGN with all these annotations for you to study. One of you is, uh, just asked me, do you give private lessons? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. You can uh, uh, write me about that as well on my email, or you can just send me your message uh, like through through my website tigerlevel.com anytime. I'll be more than happy to give you my uh, my thoughts and suggestions. So yeah, I mean like really, A5 is a super cool move. We got A4 coming. We got the white knight being kicked out, and then <clears throat> in case white plays f4, we just challenge him, and it's perfect. It's a great sequence. Drive the knight, take the f4, and then after the exchange, and g takes f4, black plays bishop c5. Now, is this supposed to win? No. In end games, we can't win. In King Indian, you have to understand that there is this part which we call subtlety. You have to be very subtle with the way and how you really reposition, regroup, and set all the pieces in motion. Something that Black knew is that if you play King Indian, you have to hurry only when you need to. This means if your opponent has a danger set in place, if he wants to challenge you or attack you or does something like that, what you realize is that he doesn't actually do much. He doesn't create anything more powerful. And this is a beautiful move. Like now with this candidate, uh, you can understand that um, in case of bishop takes to the c, you can do dydex to the c. The rook can come close. The knight can go together. 
these two will be fantastic. And you realize how backward most of white spaces actually feel like. This was brilliant. So in the end of the day, after the move of uh, like Night X to the Sea, it was good. It was very, very good. So what did White do? I mean, he played Rook H F1. Anyone? Anyone would like to continue and recommend on how Black is supposed to carry on here? It's a very good position, I have to admit. So what do we do now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So actually, this is very interesting. Black has a good night space. Everything looks perfect. Rook D8. Awesome. Thank you. This is it. You see? You know the pattern, don't you? That's a good idea. Let's get the rook around here so we can have the ability to advance the knight and then we have the opportunity to step up with those knights, with that rook. And you see, black is starting to dominate white with one thing. Better pieces. Not with queen sacrifices. This is not practical. This is not going to happen in your games. But in your games, you could really rely on the subtlety because your opponent wouldn't expect it because he wouldn't consider it dangerous. So while you keep strengthening and improving and getting better, he's just going to have to stay back and sit back and not enjoy everything that's coming at him. A3? So that was very dangerous, I have to say. And seeing the danger of it over here and the challenges coming on the queen side, I think it becomes very apparent why he's in trouble. Well, that's what happened in any case. A3, B3, and H5 to drive White's bishop out of the way. It was driven away. So Black played a very strong sequence. Think about it. If you already have the pieces so well positioned and you're keeping the opponent back, you've taken away all the good squares, what do you do with that? I mean, it's good to be strong, but how do you really make your pieces better? Is there a possibility? Or well, maybe not. Think about that. Let me know your suggestion. Hmm. You know, this is the perfect thing of the kings in the end. Yes, knight d3. It's the moment where you get to use these well advanced pieces together, what we call is, what we call is coordination, and make it painfully difficult for the opponent to defend. In fact, it's kind of so bad that he doesn't have any defense versus knight c3. It's amazing. So if he does knight king c2, there is a check. Is this, this one will be reached out no matter what. And uh, yeah, f takes g, f takes g. Rook f6, and that check happened. I mean, white moved this king, but then the rook fell. <laughs> and then black just plays his king on the e7. His other rook goes out there. And last accurate move is to get, get the rook into the play, cover the e5. And then it's 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 beautiful and winning. What I want to show you, wanted to show you with this game is what to do if people exchange the queens. Because other times your attack is going to work. As I showed earlier, knight c6 challenge here. If he pushes that, knight comes up, f5, all of this. But that's working with the queens on the board. Even though you're not using the queens, the queens are always this important, uh, you know, value, this important quality to you. To, to let you know at any point a king side attack or tactics are available. With the queens off the board, many people feel frustrated because they know, oh, you know what? I don't know. I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling terrible about this because I'm going to experience all the damage, all the, all the danger, and I don't know what to do. So you see, this is a good time for you to understand what to do when queens are off the board so that you don't have to worry about you know, like the challenges and everything. It's a good very, very good sequence, and the plan is terrific. So uh, that's what I wanted to show you in terms of the best, uh, you know, activity and, you know, like resources that you can get with this opening. Of course, there is more, so don't worry. Don't leave just yet. What I want to show you next is a pretty awesome classical game that was played by David Bronstein. Oh, the great David Bronstein and Franz, Franz Zita. This was played in the Moscow Prague Championship in 1946. And it shows how the piece play really works out so well. 
in the King Sindian. So let's go. Let's have a look. Just to remind you guys, this is just a small bit of, of information and knowledge that you can know about King Sindian to set you up and give you an impression of what the plans are. Check out the link below this video for an incredible deal of more than 50 hours of training on the King Sindian and repertoires by, by I believe, more than five or six grandmasters uh, for a gr an amazing deal of only $20. So you can actually check it out. It's it's pretty much almost for free. I mean, imagine, imagine how good this is. And, and then, okay, on the other hand, this will help you to learn the opening, to study it gradually and actually be able to play it because... Still, still, you see, it's not an easy opening. I'm making it look easy, but when you play it, you obviously need to know a lot of these little details that you can combine to make it work. So check that out. This is good. On another hand, if you want me to send you a PGN of these annotations that are the you know of games that I see and show, send me an email. I'll be more than happy to do so. So um, yeah, one of you asked, "What is your USCF?" I don't have a USCF. I am not in uh, in US, but you can actually. My my PDA is about twenty four thirty eight. If I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so okay, here's my email. Check it out. Send me an email uh, if you want me to send you all the uh, annotations with the graphic analysis and all of this, so you could study the the lesson uh, later. So let's see, Bronstein Zeta. Perfect ex learning example on what to do, how to play the King's Indian. In fact, it's interesting because it didn't even start with the King's Indian. It transposed. So that kind of, that's kind of a good way to see how you can actually transpose into the King's Indian. It transposed from the uh, English, and then White played D3. D sorry, D4, Knight D7. Slightly different order, but Black still got G6 in place. Bishop G2, Bishop G7, castles castles and pawn to b3 so as white played it this way black did rook to e8 bishop b2 and pawn to c6 and that is a very good structure i want you to understand those three pawns now what are they, what are they doing well d6 is the base supporting e5 e5 is very strong as it's always intending to move even if not it's cutting off the white dark square bishop and is just challenging d4 C6 is also very helpful because it creates a mini pawn chain versus white's light square bishop, uh, so it doesn't let it to attack, as well as it covers the squares of d5 and b5. Most of all, it opens the queen, so black can find an active place for his queen as well. So just, I want you to know what this is about. White played e4, which I don't think was a great move, but a lot of people will do it. Takes, takes. So here's a good question. White's pretty strong, and it looks like black is a bit limited here. So do you think there is in any way for black to get his pieces out and really start doing stuff? Take a second and let me know. What do you think black should do or he's supposed to do in this position? Okay. Just asking, uh, but where are we going to study the Mardo Plata variation and stuff? Well, the Mardo Plata variation, I'm going to show it a little bit later. I mean, uh, but yes, in fact, Mardo Plata is a great line to talk about. It's just check those videos that I mentioned on the link below. It has a lot of these and more. So I'm pretty sure you will love the lectures uh, that are provided on almost every important opening line out there. So, okay. Now let's talk a little bit about. So, what is this? What is this all about? What should Black try to do now? Anyone? Please give me your thoughts. Queen B6, beautiful, very good move. The Queen B6 is setting up the Queen on a nice diagonal, so we can challenge the opponent's knight, as well as we can have a good bishop. And then, once again, Black is simply setting up his pieces towards the middle. That is what this is all about. Let's set the pieces and let's keep them around. Queen d2, knight c5, rook fe1, and now the perfect a5. Now I want you to see how black is configuring every piece. Not only did the knight is putting pressure together with the other knight on the rook, the bishop is like it's it's the stinks as we call it. So it's like at any point it can get involved and it will likely play a critical role. The queen is pretty good at the b6, you know, like in hidden uh, like in hidden position. It's just 
trying to stay and wait until the right moment comes for it to attack. The pawn is great because it can challenge. And even though it seems like white has more space, space by itself does not help unless you can get something out of it, like the control. In fact, white's more like it overextended here, I'd say, which gives black brilliant opportunities. So white played rook b1, sort of x-raying the black queen. Now, what do you think black has to do now? Let's see if anybody has an idea or a suggestion for black's best candidate. Hmm. See, one of the things that's coming is, watch just say, all right, you are good, but how would you actually set up the attack? What would you do to try and, uh, like, attack out there? How do you make it work? And it's a very, very good question because it's not easy to really figure out what to do. And yet I want you to think. Just think a little bit about this. Black is terrific. He's got space. He's got opportunities. He's got activity. Things are fantastic. Just the question only is how. How do we do whatever we're going to do in order to make it work? It's a great question. It's a very, very good query. So think about it. Does anybody have an idea or suggestion? Not e4. Okay, so one of you asked a question that's good. Can you explain how we should study uh, openings that are uh, like King's Indian? Very theoretical and sharp lines. Okay, this is fine. Let me let me tell you. Do you recommend it for uh, under two thousand? I definitely do recommend it, but you need to know how to study it. There are three things that you need to do when you're studying an opening like that. So listen to me carefully, now. The first thing that you need to do is to understand the order, the main goal, and the plan. This means you have to listen to videos as well as uh, look at look at master games so that you can get an impression. I do recommend that you follow and you do uh, maybe some notes on the, you know, like it's a summary on the different lines. That will help you to brainstorm the major highlights that you can base all the further knowledge. You see, it's, it's important that you don't try to memorize the moves because you will forget them. It's important that you to try to focus on the ideas, on the plans, and the sequences that follow those plans. That's the first thing. So, second important thing. What about the forcing lines? What about the, the specific lines that are, that are longer? Now, for those lines, you need to exercise on playing them. This is the second. A perfect way to play, to exercise in an opening is to play against a strong player or against a good opponent, sparring partner, to, to just play and get a feel for the opening. If you don't have a sparring partner or you don't have the time, you can do it against a computer. Put it on a higher level. Let him beat you. So the idea will be to see where you're making mistakes and then gradually correct yourself. That is a very important thing so that you get better. You can reference books and stuff while you're playing. That's how you can learn it better. Okay, and then there's like the third thing that I need to mention. Third, very important thing. Okay, study with a coach. Study the opening with a coach. Ask him to show you typical ideas, not just to explain to you what I'm actually trying to just like, okay, this is the theoretical move in that one. It's good, but what you can do when you're in one on one training with a coach, what I do with my students very often, is that I make them to think. I ask them key critical questions of some of the most typical positions. Ask them to test you, okay? It's, it can explain you the theory. The theory you can also study from a video. But the best or a role of a coach is that he can test you. And then when you fail, he can actually tell you how to do better. And so he can test you again. The important thing is to get tested. To, to make sure that he tests you on the typical key, most important positions. So one, try to learn the main plan's goal and sequences. Two, play more games so that you can get the feel for the opening. And three, make sure that you like get 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 to you know like test by coach or just play some practice games with him. That's a very good way to follow. And, uh, yeah, that's what I'd like to say. Well, so I hope that it makes sense. What about the study information? Uh, well, once again, check that video below. Uh, check that package below the video. It's, a, it's incredible. For about 20 bucks, you can get more than 15 hours, I believe, of uh, video lectures and 
but you know training material by top players and teachers it's an incredible deal you get you because you get 50 percent off of the regular price for that for that bundle so you can check it up and then you can really learn a great deal if you want to turn this opening into your major weapon and believe me you do even if it sounds complex when i'm explaining it it's a great opening so let's get back to it now what do we do after rig b1 what should black try to do okay as soon as the white rook came out on the b1 square, what black played was a4. It was a super good move. Why? Because after all, we need to create threats. See, usually the way and how black strategy works in this opening is in three stages. First is development and, you know, setting up the bases. Then we are, you know, coordinating our pieces and getting them together. And then the third part comes, which is the, you know, the challenges. We start advancing and threatening with those pieces. Now, Black already developed. He sets up the pieces around on more advanced squares to co connect, you know, like the challenge on E4 and the queen on B6. And now we set that up. If White takes, this means he gets to create some huge weaknesses into his own position. That will be bad. And when he doesn't, we'll be creating the ones. So he played bishop A1, exchange, takes. And now black jumps with the other knight, knight g4, which was terrific. So now the knight has a great prospect in e5. But anyway, white wanted to just do uh, h3. Okay, so black's knight square bishop needs to be developed. I agree. But uh, you see, the other important thing you need to know about that bishop is that even though it needs to be uh, put out, it's, well, that has to happen in a while, in time. For now... Black just needs to figure out a good way to set his pieces and make them work together. For now, it's been going perfectly well. So it's it's a matter of how do we go from now on. Does anybody have a suggestion on what Black should do next right now? Keep looking. Now, a lot of activity, a lot of strength, a lot of power. This is good, but something has to happen. How? Anyone? 95 maybe. Absolutely. That's not a bad move. I quite like it. But Black figured out that there is an even more powerful move that we can do. And nobody has suggested it yet. Nobody is there yet. Knight e5 is good. Trust me, it's not bad. Bishop takes d4 would give away to dark square bishop, so certainly we don't want that. And here we go. Rook takes a1. Awesome. This is such a cool move. The idea being is pretty simple. If white accepts to take the knight, we take on b1, and then we win a pawn, so obviously he will be in trouble. But the beauty comes from the, from the move of rook takes a1. The only piece that could oppose the black dark square bishop has been removed. So that means we are able to destroy the power of his position, the F, you know, like the bishop, and then all the tactics fall into place. I mean, you can check it out now. Uh, queen takes F2 leads to knight D3. The attack here and the attack here and the attack here and everything is high hanging for white. If he takes on EF2 with his king, we realize there is knight takes to B3, which discovers a threat against the queen, the knight, and the rook together. And then, you know, in the end of the day, it's like a real disaster. I mean, why try to rook E3? to just move away and protect this square as we have maybe put some more pieces on the on the line. But it didn't matter because black just takes an h3. Of course, an exchange will apparently give away the light square bishop. I mean, so what happened when white lost the dark square bishop? He can't do that. And then when he moves, black just continued with knight f2. That knight is untouchable. It's incredible because if he takes it, d4 falls. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see how big the whole sequence actually happens to be. It's it's incredible, it's effective. And then okay, uh the knight g4 is still is still being threatened. Rook f3, the pawn on e4 falls, which is bad. I mean really bad, I have to say. And then after knight f2, rook e uh, rook f2 three, knight x to the c c takes e4, uh then there is knight g4 check, king h1, 
and F5. I love that last move because it really does what we call as stabilizing the position. Just it really keeps everything together and for the most part just gets it all in place. The knight is great on e4. The dark square bishop as well as the queen, they're they're amazing. And uh, I mean this is game over basically. White white's knight two knights are being attacked. His king is still in trouble. Bishop e5 may come in. Wow. I mean this is what you really want when you play the King's Indian. And you know what? This is not a dream sequence. I didn't show you the queen sacrifice. You know how many beautiful games are in the King's Indian? I wanted to show you real gritty examples on what you can expect and do in your games. That's why I picked up those games. So black just destroys white center. And yeah, I mean, you can really do that yourself. This is great. Bishop e5. And then, okay, white's queen has to move somewhere, but it really doesn't matter because we set our own queen up. Okay, there is a checkmating threat actually to happen, so white had to sort of run, but, uh, I mean, to, to, to defend them. But now black made this very unique queen back to this. So we have queen h6 to queen h2. The rook is open, and, I mean, it's incredible the black flexibility of his pieces and how how incredible this is. There is queen h6. Uh, rook d1 is coming on the next move. So we can see how much in trouble the white king is. And then the h3 bishop can be defended. I mean, you see, this is amazing to see, I mean, from the very beginning on how black was able to really s compose his pieces so well and so beautifully towards the center. And then with that composition, he was able to turn into to turn this into incredible initiative with the exchange knight g4 rook takes a1 and then knight takes f2 you just see this is the result of everything that's being built up and that's something that can very easily happen in your game you know this is not just like a oh sweet nice looking combination by made by a grandmaster it's something you can do because why just play very serious and real like a lot of people would just play like that develop play rook b1 against the queen and that's what you do. Maybe not in the same sequence, but you see the power of the opening. That's pretty much it. So uh, if, again, if, you, if any one of you wants to have uh, these examples sent in a PGN file, just let me know. I'd be more than happy to uh, like send you all these uh, you know files uh, the, with the graphic annotations and you know everything else, so you could uh, you know so you could study them and then take a look and probably like understand them a little bit better. So send me send me that one. Perhaps you need a PGN viewer as well, but that's easy to download from anywhere. So I think that this is great, especially if you want to add some notes from today's webinar uh, there will be of course an offline recording of this so you can review it later in case you missed any part but I do encourage you to once again check out the uh, the link below uh, below the video because it offers 50% discount on an incredible package of more than 15 hours of video lectures you can be selective about them you can just study the lines or variations that you want to follow they're incredible because we're talking about top GMs and 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 you know like strong grandmasters and, and incredible teachers so you can uh, uh, listen to the to these really improve your knowledge and understanding of this opening and uh, if you have any questions any further questions you can actually send those to me um, you know to to my email which is valeri.willove at gmail.com send me your questions or if you want me to send you the files from today's lesson or you can visit my website to uh, ask me more questions or anything else related to your chess as well. Check this out. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks again, and I'll see you next Saturday at 12 p.m. New York time.